Morena, welcome to church. Good to see you all here today. Oh well, keep it warm. No one was bucketing water out of the kitchen or anything last night. No leaks. <laughs> Pleased that we've got no leaks in here. I thought I'd come in for a quick check this morning, but we're good. We're warm and dry. How good to get together in one room. So good to get together. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notices. I uh, want to warmly welcome any visitors or guests with us. Uh, so great to have you join us. Um, Hopefully someone next to you will probably be in touch with you and get to know who you are, where you might be from. Uh, we do have some formal ways to do that as a church. Um, so Linda White is up the back there, yep. um, giving you a wave. And so if you see her, if you're new with us, um, we've got to get a connection card just for us to get some of your details um, to hopefully better connect with you more meaningfully perhaps during the week. Uh, but welcome and enjoy your time with us. Um, hopefully you'll meet and make some new friends. Just a reminder, um, each week we're doing a few housekeeping things around here, uh, just for water and closed cup drinks only in the auditorium. Otherwise, please feel free to make a mess in the cafeteria area, all over the vinyl, uh, food and drink. Let's enjoy our hospitality time out here together. Awesome, hey, we've got an exciting announcement this morning. I'm not sure how many months it's been, but we are relaunching our Fusion Sundays. So that's very exciting for our intermediate age young people. Uh, that's our 10, 11, 12 year olds primarily. Uh, so we're going to be doing it every second Sunday, thanks to uh, Dylan and Kirsty Jeffress. I'm not sure that they're in just yet. Uh, but today is going to be the first Sunday of those every second Sundays. And they'll just duck out after our worship time. So it's kind of just during our preaching spot. It's a bit of a bridging age range, and it's really good to be able to provide this for them, just for some Q&A around the content that um, comes around on Sundays. And faith formation stuff, which um, just in that age range, it's like they're not necessarily up for the uh, Hot Wheels cars on the on the carpet and some of our kids' program stuff with Play-Doh, but they're also not necessarily <laughs> stoked about sitting for 40 minutes listening to some person up the front. So it's awesome that um, Dylan and Kirstie have volunteered for that. So there'll be every second Sunday this week uh, included moving forward, and um, they can just duck out before the preaching. And also a reminder for our kids... Hopefully as a parent you're getting to the new habit of signing your kids in before entering the auditorium. So if you want to duck out and do that now, that would be great. So that our kids can suddenly move out after song two to their kids program. Awesome. Are we getting used to the new space? Hanging out together? It's good, isn't it? Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to pray before we enter into praise. God, we thank you for the invitation you bring to us, God, to be close, to be near, to commune with you, Father God, to join with the family of God, brothers and sisters, God, in agreement. May we lift our voices and lift our faith in our hearts this morning, God, in adoration of you, in expectation of you for our future with you. In Jesus' name, be exalted in our praise. Amen. Listen, arise, my soul, arise, my soul.
your name, Lord, because you are so worthy this morning. You're worthy of our praise, Lord God, and we just lift your name on high, Lord, the name that's above every other name, and uh, Lord, we just want to worship you and praise you. We welcome you in the place, Lord. Lord, you said, Lord, whenever a couple of us get together, Lord, you're in our midst, so we just want to welcome you, Lord, in the place this morning. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, you're so welcome, Lord. Come and do what you want to do in our lives, Lord. We worship you, Father.
is our heavenly Father, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Sing the one who was, the one who is, the one who is to come. The one who was, the one who is, the one who is to come. Our faithful King, the Praise again, oh. 
God, we just thank you, Lord. You're a majestic king. You are the majestic king. You're the majestic king of kings and lord of lords. Let me sing. Majestic is your name, you seated in heavenly places, and you're clothed in splendor and majesty, but you're also my closest friend right now, standing right beside you. Just thinking as we were singing that song, what a song of the God of gods, the King of kings, the God of all ages. Remember how our gods never fail us. And he's so true. And I was thinking as we are coming off the end of that song. And you're clothed in splendor and majesty. Seated at the right hand of the Father. Which is true. But he's also your closest friend. You love her. Father, we drink of your cup, Lord. Such a personal God. Lord, for every heart, for every spirit here, Lord. For every single person. Father, we worship you, we worship you. You're awesome, honey. You're awesome, honey. Sing, 
word of war and wonder of you, God. How great and mighty you are. How faithful. How beyond our comprehension, Lord. How good beyond our lifetime. We recognize your holiness this morning. The great sense of that worship this morning. The angels in heaven, they just sing holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lamb that was slain. Holy, holy, holy. You know, until we are just left, I'm only singing holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. There's more to be revealed. There's more to understand of His goodness, of His greatness, of His faithfulness. That's what the angels see. what he's revealing to us that our lives would just sing holy 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 is the Lord holy is the Lamb that was slain Lord may our lives of worship not just our song this morning sing the wonder of your goodness of your greatness of your grace of your mercy God of your faithfulness from the beginning of time reaching into humanity through people Jesus, by your spirit. God, reveal it even now all the amazement of how good you are, how great you are. And we'd just be left singing holy. choose to lay down the other things that we've perhaps pursued. God, write our hearts this morning. Create in us a clean heart. Renew that right spirit, God, that you have given. And ask, Lord Jesus, that our vision would be your life through us. There is nothing greater, there's nothing that can ever exceed it in all the pursuits of the world, Lord. So we fix our eyes on you, Jesus, again today. Take a hold of our hearts. Whatever way you got, you know what that means for each one of us. Lord, the things that are competing for that place. Lord, only you deserve it. So have it this morning. Come on, don't spectate this morning. I hope you're praying. I hope you're confessing. I hope you're seeking in your own heart, mind, and soul this morning. Lord, have that place. He's calling each one of us. He's calling us together, but he's calling each one of us together. God, we want to respond to you appropriately. And it's just as your spirit beckons that we would come. We would say, yes, Lord, you can have that. Yes, Lord, you can have that. Yes, little Lord, Lord, I'll let you into that space. Come on, let's be that offering to you. Fantastic. How good together and sing. Be amazed by God and His graciousness yeah. and His revelation of His Spirit, His tangible closeness to us. And He's good. He's so good. Wonderful. So, our fusion and intermediate age, 10, 11, 12, can make their way out. Thank you so much, Dylan and Kirsty, for uh, what you've done with our young people. It's powerful and effective. I want to just pray for our kids. Lord, we thank you for uh, what you're doing in us as a family. Lord, that it's not just the big people that you're journeying with, that you're leading and you're teaching, but God, we thank you for every person that makes up the family. Lord, from the young ones right through, Lord Jesus, we thank you that um, you have a plan and purpose every day for each one of us, God, to walk with you. And so we just pray this morning, God, that you would empower teachers, you would move by the power of your spirit in our young people's lives. 
Lord, may they, may they catch a revelation of your goodness, of your faithfulness, of your closeness, of your, of your invitation to friendship even as Carl mentioned this morning. How accessible you are, Lord Jesus. Thank you for making a way. And we just pray you move in their program this morning and their lesson and their interactions together. God, may your word, word come alive to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Fantastic. Hey, well, I um, just want to welcome Pastor Mike back. This is two weeks in a row. Yes. Yeah. So again, we're entering into our vision series. Um, Mike might unpack some more of that just around recognising our calendar here in the Southern Hemisphere in New Zealand and Timaru. And I just believe God's got some stuff appointed for us in this season. So we have been leaning in and um, hope and pray that you have been leaning into uh, what God is leading us into for this time. And for what's ahead, because who knows what he does today is not just for the warm fuzzies of today, often it's preparation for tomorrow, it's preparation for next month, for the year ahead, and so even when we don't understand perhaps why he's putting his finger on things, let's just be receptive to him knowing better than we do. So God, have your way with us this morning. Thanks, Pastor Mike. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How nice is it to have a warm lounge room to meet in? Hey, come on. Uh, it's not yet the heat pumps, but it will be. Stand in faith with us people. It's only been eight weeks, but we do hope to bring a good report to you soon. But uh, great to have a heater that's done a great job uh, in the back there as well. Well, uh, I hope you're doing well. I hope you are managing to stay warm and particularly dry uh, at the moment. Man, that rain just came hard and long last night, didn't it? Just kept on coming. I was uh, hoping that we'd all be... Uh, above the waterline this morning, uh, and like Jamie, we can hope the building's above the waterline as well. That'd be great. <laughs> the river, you know, it doesn't matter. It's all good, but uh, it is great to get it. It's great to get in the family home that God has given to us, and uh, wonderful for us to take this time of year really just to reflect. We talked last week, we had a wonderful celebration for those of you who are here. Um, it's just great that we were able to celebrate um, Sophie's decision to go through the waters of baptism. And, um, she's not just a daughter of mine, but she's a daughter of ours, this family. This uh, family has helped to form and to encourage and, and, and to speak life to her to get to a point where she decided that she wanted to make that decision. That was great. But we kind of took the opportunity to kind of use it as a reminder Sunday to kind of talk about you know, a bunch of us have done this thing, we've gone to the waters of baptism, we've said, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, just to quote the words of the song, but that's what we did when we said we would go through the waters of baptism, and it's so great, like, at any wedding or any other kind of covenantal ceremony, to be reminded of what we have perhaps previously entered into, but we don't live as mindful of as we did at the time when we made it. Does that make sense? Yeah. I said, now when I take a wedding, you know, you're, you're kind of talking to the bride and groom in front of you, but the reality is they will not remember a word that you said because they're too busy staring into each other's eyes, <laughs> diving off the deep end into those pools of eyes in their face, uh, well-dressed face, just, on the, just next to them there. And so you end up talking to the room of people behind them, beyond them, their support crew, to remind them of the nature of the the covenant that's being made in that moment, but you know that a bunch of those people have made those that decision once upon a time, and uh, it's good for them, them, and I include me in that, us, to be reminded of that, because whenever I preach those messages, I preach them to myself as well. Yeah, Michelle said amen. <laughs> if, you, if you missed it in the back there. Uh, and so it's so important that actually we are a community that is committed to remembering who we are and what we are about. It has been said that we need far more reminding than we do instructing. Uh, we have this bad habit in our Western culture. For those of you who don't know, we are in the West. Uh, we have a Western mindset, uh, which is based around a bunch of things which we will not be unpacking today. But one of the kind of uh, myths or the lies that we have believed as a, as a culture is that if we could just get more information, we would get better. Yeah. Do, do you guys recognize that as being a potential yeah. problem? Yeah. Uh, I'm really mindful of this. I've just been in class all week um, doing uh, another paper on a course of study that I've engaged in that will take me the next couple of years. And I've come back knowing more than I've ever known about the topic I went to study. 
which just happened to be the New Testament. But the reality is, unless I apply anything that I've learned, nothing in my life will change. Unless it goes from here, through here, and out to here, nothing in my life will actually change. If we could just know a bit more, then we would be better. Nah, it doesn't work like that. It's about um, being reminded of these things so we can not just give mental assent to them, but they can literally transform us as that information goes from our head to our heart and out of our hands. And so Vision Sunday for us, I used to make a big song and dance about it, promote it on everything that we've got, but really, it's a family day, it's family business. We're talking about what is it that makes us a community? What is it that has been put out in front of us? What's the finish line of the race for every person who calls Jesus Lord, who's been through the waters of baptism? It's this opportunity to actually remind us all who we are, what we signed up for, and what this community is all about. Because that's essentially who we are. That's what makes us family, is that we have a shared race to run. What is that then? What is that finish line for all of us? Well, we're the community of God, we're the people of God. What is that shared vision for us? Is it that we all want to be the best doctor that New Zealand's ever had? No, that's problematic. Some of us haven't been to medical school. Actually, <laughs> nearly all of us haven't been to medical school. Uh, that's a problem. We want to be the best plumbers for Jesus yes. ever been. Well, I'd like to be a plumber too. I've seen how they charge. But, <laughs> I, um, but we're not all plumbers. We're not all plumbers. Um, and we've got some very gracious ones in the church that help us out from time to time as well. And it's just to make up for the charging comment. <laughs> oh, you appreciate that, Rob. Um, what is it that we want to be the most prosperous? We really want to be the most financially prosperous people in all of Timor. That's that's our vision, eh, guys? That's what we orient our lives towards. Like we just want to nail that. Like if we could not secure just wealth for us, but for our children, our children's children, then we would really be faithful to the race that God has called us to run. Seeing some nods, though. Not sure everyone's convinced. Everyone's like, that'd be nice. Can you teach us that? <laughs> could, we, could we devote a series to that? Just maybe one or two every month. Because um, we're like that. Because our culture says, or our culture's finish line, or as philosophers would use this term, telos, this, this idea that this, this end goal that we're all aiming for and towards, this thing we're moving to get it for. This is some of the wins that um, communities outside this community have. In fact, the culture, the marinade that we are sitting in, when we are not sitting as the people of God, being formed by the story of God, we actually sit in environments where we're actually being sold another finish line. Mm. Is that fair? Mm. Yeah. Come on, what is it? You know, what? Literally, if you, uh, I did a new, as I said, New Testament paper for my masters this week, and so you're just sitting in the first two centuries. You're sitting in the ancient world. What happened? Uh, kind of just after the time switch, after Je- from the time Jesus arrives on the scene for the next 200 years. What's going on in the world? What's happening in that context? And you realize that all of the stuff that was problematic then is still the stuff that's problematic yeah. now. And we all think the world's changing at a, a rapid rate of knots. And that's absolutely true. But there's some things that have been just as dysfunctional for a really long time. Yeah. 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 Pleasure. Money, fame, power. It's pretty much humanity. That's pretty much human history. That we would have a talos or an end goal or a destination that is either one of those things or a mix of those things. And we would say that if you either get that thing or you get a mix of those things, then when you arrive at that point, then you are living the good life. Or the flourishing life. That's what. That's the PR that we marinate in all of the time. Every advertisement that you ever see is designed to make you think, if I only had that, life would be better. Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole industry, billions of dollars, that's sustained on that premise that you want something that you don't currently have that can somehow improve the quality of your life. Is that right? 
this is the story of our culture. But we are a community that said we are not interested and we do not want to spend our life pursuing those things. We are a people that want to be more like Jesus. That's what makes us family here. That's some of the things we've named are some of the idols that we left behind. We walked away from those things. Sometimes we miss this when we, when we read the text because we can sit there and like the ancient world, we can kind of have a life that's going a particular way and then we go, oh, we've been introduced to this new God and his name is Jesus. We're going to add him into the mix of things that we're already doing and then we're going to just carry on on our way. But that's not true of the church in those first couple of hundred years, the early church. What it meant to, to buy into Jesus was to leave everything else behind and totally live and learn a totally new way of life. A new way to view pleasure, a new way to view money, a new way to view influence, a new way to view how we steward and manage our time. They actually went from running this race with this finish line to running this race with a new finish line. And you can't run this race well while you're trying to run this race. That's why Paul and, uh, well, not Paul, whoever wrote Hebrews, there's much conjecture and no one still really knows because there's no one named in the letter as being the writer. And Hebrew is not a first name or a last name. It's the name of the people of God, right? Israel. And so uh, he, they write after the Hall of Faith or the Hall of Fame chapter, Hebrews 11, the Champions of Faith. In Hebrews 12, it says that we need to throw off the sin and weight that so easily entangles and run the race that God has marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, Jesus the pioneer and perfecter, or the author and the finisher, or the starter and the completer. Whatever you want to say, however you want to say it, and whatever translation you are reading, there's this idea that there's a new race that we're running, and the only way we can actually run that race well and have any chance of completing it and getting a well-done, good and faithful service, servant is to have our eyes completely fixed on Jesus. Jesus. We are Jesus people. Aren't we? Yeah. My goal this year is profound. It's it was profound last year when I had the same one and the same one the year before. Hopefully this time next year I will look more like Jesus. Hopefully my life will look more like Jesus. Now obviously I can't go with the long hair. That's not going to work. Okay, there's just some things. And if those of you who are intercessors, please keep praying for me. It would be great to have some sort of thick locks and you know, get a tan like Jesus, you know, because he wasn't a white guy. I know that's shocking for most of us. Um... But there's a whole lot of ways I can't look like Jesus, but there's a whole bunch of ways that I can look like Jesus, and I want to talk about that today. Is that right? Yeah. Awesome. We are a community that has a shared vision. We're trying to run the same life. Where This is a gym. This is a place where we're kind of seeking the same kind of transformation. We're encouraging one another on the gym. We're learning from those who are a bit further down the track, and we're encouraging those who are a few steps behind is that what this place is? Yeah. Good, I'm in the right place there. I've prepared the right message anyway. Yeah. For the group. Cool. So what does this thing look like? What is it cool? Cool to be people who share the same goal in life, the same talos in life to become more like Jesus, who live out of the same script. You can just make that the scriptures if you want to. That is our script. That is our story that frames life why we, who we are, why we're here, who he is, what he is about. It's the, the, the common script that we share together. Well, those people have been called, and we'll call it in the Bible, and are still called now, disciples. Disciples is really just a name for students in the ancient world. Uh, certainly in the ancient Hebrew world, right? You'd be disciples. But there's evidence that's around in the Greek culture and uh, and, and, and the Roman um, space that these people who are students who imitate someone to learn from them to become like them. Sometimes we can forget that because we live in that Western world like we said at the start that sometimes we think actually having head knowledge about something makes us a student of something rather than becoming like something makes us a student of something. 
Yeah? Yeah. And so we can think, oh, cool, I'm going to be a student now, so I just need to sit in the classroom for two hours and get through that 40 minute thing that Jamie was talking about earlier that some of them aren't old enough to get through, <laughs> uh, which I think is this thing, this talk, this conversation. If we can just get there and get the information, then everything will change. But in the ancient world, you literally had to do what I said before, which is walk away from everything else so you could walk with your rabbi. You become a disciple of your rabbi. Everyone would now know you as not such and such the fisherman or such and such the tax collector or such and such the whatever you did before then, but now the biggest title over your life, your superordinate identity. There's a fancy one. Your, your identity that goes before all other identities, your overarching, the biggest identity you could possibly have now is that you are a disciple of this person and you're walking with them, learning about who they are, what they are about, and learning to be about the business that they are about. The best word we have in our modern English is apprenticeship. Apprenticeship. We would say that's different from, you say, if you're doing an apprenticeship, do you go to university and sit in a lecture theatre? That's not the majority of your formation, is it? If you're doing an apprenticeship, we've got a bunch of guys that have been through apprenticeships here, you do a little bit of book learning, do a little bit of class learning, but most of your learning is actually done working with people who have already done it, uh, do, have done the study, are doing the work, and they are teaching you to do the work, and encouraging you, and correcting you, and helping you become competent in the work, so that when their time is done, there will still be good builders, plumbers, sparkies, whatever, who are able to serve the community once they're gone. That literally is the best way to see the life and work of Jesus. Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, hey guys, I'm going to teach you this stuff because one day I'm going to be gone and you're going to have to carry on the work. This is what we understand our faith to be. So I just want to give you three quick points. If we can have that first slide up. Josiah, it would be great. The computer never does what it's told, but it's told. But like we said, uh, our apprenticeship to Jesus, thats this is who we are as a community. We are apprentices of Jesus. So I just want to unpack just quickly three points what that looks like. And today is just an introduction. We're going to have a series. We're going to have other um, speakers in the team coming and unpacking this one at a time. And then we want to do the next week doing a whole lot of practical examples of what that looks like. Because for some of us, uh, we really need that. And if it's apprenticeship... Having the knowledge isn't going to help us anyway. We need to work out how to get that knowledge into our everyday lives so that it can have the transforming work that uh, God longs for it to have in our hearts. Because this is not a new way of thinking. This is a new way of being. If you're not sure where that fits, go and read the Sermon on the Mount and see if that's not an unusual way of being. Loving your enemy. Sharing your stuff. Looking after the people around you. Forgiving, not holding on to offence. Being people who do not trust in the work of your own hands, but trusting in the God who made your hands, by the way. It's living life out of a different story to the one the world is living out. And so what are these key points of discipleship that we can learn from understanding that our world is trying to tell us that, hey, if you want to be part of something, you just need to get some knowledge about it and turn up in the right classroom from time to time, whether that be church or small group or whatever, and then that's going to change your life. Now, there's a little bit more to it. So we just want to remind us all today what some of the key points of discipleship are. Number one, the first thing that the disciples did before they ever behaved before they ever knew the story, before they ever really understood everything that was going on, they simply had a guy come to them who called them to be with him. It says that in Mark's Gospel. There's obviously so many parts in the Gospels of the stories of Jesus coming to particular people and saying, what did he say? Come and follow, come and follow me. He was, remember, some, it's very easy to get this confused. There's no social media at this stage. Okay, so he's not saying, 
click like on my channel. He's not saying accept my friend request. He's actually saying come follow me. And so there was one day he came up to a guy called Rob Bradley. And Rob Bradley was working at Genius Homes in the factory. And he was sitting there going, man, I can't wait till I'm fully qualified because Thomas can charge it. Anyway, no, anyway, he wasn't having that dream. That's not the dream for his life at all. He's a wonderful man, by the way, for those of you who think I'm giving Rob a hard time today. He's also a good friend of mine. But Jesus comes to him and says, Rob, come and follow me. And at that moment, Rob put his tools down, took his tool belt off, and left his job. In a moment, his world changed because he was no longer a a plumber dreaming of a career in plumbing, he was now someone who decided to give all of that up so he could learn to be like Jesus and carry on the work that Jesus was doing once Jesus had gone. Is that clear? Yeah. Are we good? Yeah. Cool. So this is what it is. It doesn't mean that we all give up our jobs. Please don't take me literally here, but sometimes we take it too figuratively. Where we sit and go, oh yeah, that's just a nice idea. It's like, no, 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 no. No, he gave up his identity as this to pick up a new identity of this. And that changed every single thing about their lives. They got a new talos, a new destination for their life. Now, you wouldn't sit there and someone would say, well, now that you're a plumber that loves Jesus, so you're someone that's going to go to church on Sunday. You say, no, that's not the truth. Now, every... The way that I, that I steward every moment of my life is going to be different because I used to be running towards this end goal, but now I'm running towards this end goal. Everything has to change. But the first thing God, the first thing Jesus does to this, he said, He called them to be with Him. In Mark 3 13 to 14, Jesus went on the mountainside and called to Him those He wanted, and they came to Him. And he appointed the twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. He did that, of course, once they were trained. But it's this beautiful idea that just encapsulates and Mark is a, the shortest gospel. It says things succinctly. But it's like he called these people to be with them because he was going to train them to be ambassadors and they would go out and represent him. But how could they go out and represent him if they didn't know who he is and what he's about? It does not say that they were moved by a stirring message, said a prayer, and then carried on as usual. You know what I'm talking about, right? They prayed the one-off forgiveness of sins prayer, and then they were saved, and that changed everything and absolutely nothing at the same time. Changed everything. But before it changed everything, they had to come and be with them. If they understand, for the bunch of people that Jesus picks are not people that would normally be picked for the first team in the ancient world, certainly in Jewish culture, which is the context in which our scriptures come to us. To be chosen by a rabbi to come and be a follower, for them is a great honour. It's to be chosen out of something greater than what you were doing. It's actually an upgrade. It wasn't a downgrade, even though it came with less salary. It was actually an upgrade. I know that's shocking for some of us. To think that you could actually do something more important and earn less money. Because we're enculturated to think that's not how the world works. The more you make, the more important you are. But these guys realize this is actually an upgrade. No, I'm, I'm, I'm called to be with them and I'm going to. Uh, this is an upgrade. There's something that he sees in me that nobody else sees. There's something here, there's life itself that can't be found anywhere else. In fact, Jesus. Uh, asks them, uh, sort of halfway through their journey, their three years together, once he's fed the loaves and fishes, the 5,000 have been fed, and then a bunch of people follow him because they like it how he fills their stomachs, and so they will follow him waiting for the next meal to be made miraculously so they can eat it. Imagine if we ever were the kind of people that limited our allegiance to Jesus down to hopefully he gives us something good next. And he turns around and he says, hey guys, you missed the point. That miracle was about me telling you that I'm the bread of life. And you need to long after me, not long after getting your belly filled. And it says many left him at that time, and he turns around to the disciples and goes, you fellas going to go as well? And they said, well, we've been, we've been with you for a while. 
we've watched you. We've seen how you esteem us. We've seen how you esteem others. We've seen how the way you live and what you teach is life itself. And he said, they said, where else would we go? For you alone have the words of life. There's something when you are with Jesus that you just catch. We remember again, we think everything's taught, but we, we have these phrases even in our culture saying that you there's more caught than taught. You can decide your whole life you're not going to be like your parents, but I'm sorry to say there's going to be aspects of your parenting and your adulting that reflect your parents. Why? Because there is more court than talk. And sometimes we can find ourselves in a Christianity where we kind of go, cool, I'll do what I need to do, uh, but I don't really want to be someone who spends a bunch of time hanging out with Jesus because... What's the point? I have a distorted view of what this Christianity thing is, and it's a set of teachings that I mentally ascribe to, and that somehow is going to sort me out for my after here future. But that's not what discipleship is. It's, it's, a, it's relational before it's anything else. It's this relationship, it's this call to intimacy. I remember as a pastor's kid, um, I remember as a pastor's kid, just like I've shared before, but it's always funny, it gets, gets a laugh. But I, I preached my first message at 16, but I'm pretty sure I gave my heart to Jesus at 19. You know? But once you've been in, in, in church long enough, you pick up enough stuff to be able to talk the talk and know the tradition, know the liturgy, know how to speak, know how to act, know how to do all of those things. So I had the head knowledge, but I remember moving to Ashburton, being pulled away from my best friends who I was flatting with because I felt this was a good step because we're moving up the ladder, there was more money, you know, come on singing the song, playing the game, moved out, and here was this like hard-out extrovert who's now sitting in a flat, living by himself, going, oh, well, it's either now or never. I've uh, had some moments at youth camps where I felt God. I've seen my parents' life, and I really admire it. But that's not enough. I need to know. And after trying to read the Bible so many times in that first 19 years and going, good Christians do this, but being like bored as... And just not going, I should be able to read a whole chapter without being more. I was like, I made this, I remember sitting in, uh, in my lazy boy chair in my lounge in my flat and going, I'm going to open my Bible because I want to know the God behind all of this. And of course, the only way to do that is to read the Gospels because the invisible God is made visible in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus, who are you? What makes you tick? What are you about? And I opened it, I just couldn't put it down. Not because the Bible is so awesome, but the Bible is awesome when you have the right relationship to it. But it was actually, I said, you know, before that I knew the story, but it was then that I met the author. Yeah. And when you meet the author, it changes the way you read the story. Yeah. And now I wasn't trying to get knowledge, now I was trying to know a person. Mm. Yeah. And it was life to me. Some of us, we sit here and oh man, I'm too busy running this race over here that I just added Jesus into because I need to get an, on the housing market or we need to get this or we need to get that. We need to get that. And it, all, it literally becomes the talos of our lives whether we need to get in 10 years we've got a plan for generational wealth for 30 years or maybe we've got a, a platform that we're building and we're hoping to have X many followers or we're hoping to move two notches up in our workplace or we're hoping to have three more children. Our whole life is just, you know, wrapped around these different goals and pursuits these talosses. And we can kind of forget. Where's I going with that? Knowing him. Knowing him. We can end up with all of these other things and decide with all with the busyness of that. Thanks, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> with the busyness of that, I just don't have time to spend time with Jesus. Some of us can be really disappointed when we get to eternity. Some of us don't have time or even a desire to spend time with Jesus because we've been told that Christianity is this idea of getting a ticket for eternity so that you can go to heaven when you die. But you need to realise what heaven is like as an idea. Like, what is heaven? It's eternally fully hanging out with Jesus. It's relational, first and foremost. It's going to be fully in the presence of God. That's what makes it so good. And we get to have a foretaste of that now. Someone's going to share on that next week. And then we're going to talk about ways that we can work that out. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah.
be with Jesus. It's not a, this is not a legalistic framework. It's a relationship. That's why Israel was so keen to jump on board. We forget, some of us have been, the first mention we had was the Ten Commandments. We forget that. What's the context of the Ten Commandments? 400 years of slavery. Jesus moves sovereignly over this people against the most powerful, the most successful nation in all the world because they had the most power and that's how success works in that time. So much has changed, eh? (laughs) God moves on their behalf. And their their old boss drove them hard and did not know them by name. But their new boss, the one who's now taken them into the captivity of freedom, because that's how it works in the ancient world, if you take them one powerful force takes off the other powerful force, those prisoners become your prisoners. Their slaves become your slaves. Paul says that. We're now bond servants to Christ. So they're getting there and they're working out, well, if this God, this God, this God, the best God we've ever seen, how now do we live faithful to Him? Yeah. And God's like, well, I'll talk to Moses. I'll give you some guidelines for what worshiping me looks like. And we, we think it started off with a whole lot of expectations, but it started off with a really, really, really excited and grateful people going, how now do we use the freedom that you've purchased for us when all we've ever known is slavery? Mm-hmm. It was a grateful heart. It wasn't a religious load. It was a grateful heart. This is how this thing was birthed. Number two. We want to be with Jesus. Number two. Next one. We need to become like Jesus. As I say, you become like the people you hang around. There's a bunch of things in my life even growing up that, um, you know, I thought, oh man, they're probably not 100% right, but Anyone know, tried to change real deep things in you, in your own sin? <coughs> Anyone had any success? It'd be great if you want to come and take the mic. And just <laughs> teach us all. It doesn't really work like that, eh? But when I encountered this Jesus, it began to change the desires of my heart. I realised this guy was the real deal and I wanted to have a life that looked like his. And the more time that I spent with him, the more that I could understand him, the more I could understand what it is that he desires, mm-hmm. and how different those desires were from my desires, and I began to these pray these prayers, not like this, God can you do this, 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 and this for me which is how I used to relate to God you know, he's your pull this cord in case of emergency mm-hmm. now my prayers became Lord would you change my heart mm-hmm. can't read Luke's gospel without having a heart to the poor, you just can't why is it when everyone else is celebrating money and power and you just care about the people on the bottom of the pile? God, why don't I care about people on the bottom of the pile that much? And he goes, oh, because you're sitting in a marinade of people that are trying to get more powerful and more wealthy and they're trying everything to not be the poor people we're talking about. But God's heart didn't lead him away from the poor. It leads you to the poor. Because he has a different way of sin. Because it's not this race. It's not this race with the Jesus t-shirt on. It's this race. Is that right? But I'm just wearing a Jesus bib running this marathon. We're running this race. Different rules, different cones, different markers. This is running to the ball. This is running at home. Definitely, whatever happens, I just don't want to be in the ball. Is this making sense? So the more time we spend with him, the more we catch from him the heart. And this is so important in this option, the book of Philippians. This is literally the whole point of the whole book. Be of the same mind as Christ. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Having a set of laws, a couple of tablets with Ten Commandments on it, will not change your life. If that would have worked, we wouldn't have needed Jesus. Israel would have nailed it. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. We need Jesus. We need to walk with Him. We need to learn His ways. We need to begin to see the world like He sees the world. Christianity, I would say, is not something that you say that you belong to. It's literally a lens you put in your glasses. Blue blockers. Come on, there must be some people my age enjoyed those infomercials. Back in the day, blue blockers, you put them on, they had yellow lenses, they like plastic aviators. Super classy. 
with orange lenses, and they made everything look brighter, even on dull days. We need Jesus lenses because they actually change the way that you perceive the world around you. Because the way you thought it was, you put the glasses on like, oh, it's not like that at all. It's different. It's more brighter. And I'm not saying that Jesus is going to make everything more brighter because that's me lying to you. But it will be as transformative when you put the Jesus lenses. I thought it was this way, but it's actually that way. I saw it like this, but now I see it like that. You say, well, I've had my Jesus glass on for ages. It's like, cool. You can have your Jesus lens on and how things should be, but you won't really fully experience it like that unless you've spent time with Jesus and caught his heart and his heartbeat. The journey of sanctification, which is what the church is called, the change process from getting saved to being ultimately saved. Sanctification is that journey of stepping into those glasses, not just knowing about it, but experiencing it and living out of it, that we literally become more and more recognisable as becoming more and more like Jesus. That's the journey. I'm seeing things less like I used to and more the way that Jesus does. How does Jesus see people? I've got two people. In the group that shares the same story, which affects the way we see and value people. How does the story, the script, the scripture that we, our lives are anchored in, how does it see people? I'm going to give you a clue. Genesis 1 and 2. That's the book at the start of the Bible. Right? Creation, everything is made good. Mankind is made very good. Why? Because they carry his image. And trying to trap him, a group of religious people came to Jesus and said, Jesus, should we pay the temple taxes in front of a batch of Roman guards just standing right there? So he would say, if you don't have to pay taxes to to Caesar, then in earshot of the guards, you'll be arrested because now you're undermining Rome and its financial structures. But Jesus is smarter than even their well thought out trap. And he says, give me a coin. Give me a coin. Looks at the coin. Coins are like ours. Whose head is on the coin? Caesar. Caesar. And with the words underneath, Caesar is divine. Caesar is son of God. Right? And so he says, whose head's on it? They say, well, Caesar's. And he goes, cool. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Ta-da! That's a way to say it without getting arrested. (laughs) <laughs> basically in the Roman world that is wisdom give me what's got my image on what's got your image every person that's ever been born the world ranks people based on their status and their wealth the church goes wow another image bearer how can I show the love of Christ to people? but you don't get that from hearing a rule you get that from walking with Jesus And the process of sanctification, I was saying before, is literally the process of our hearts beginning to beat in sync with His. If your heart beats in sync with His, then you'll do what He did. If you see like He sees, if you feel like He feels, if you think like He thinks, then eventually you will... Next one. you'll end up doing what Jesus did. It's pretty complex, eh? <laughs> really complex. problem with the gospel is not its complexity. The gospel is very simple. It's just not easy. It's not its complexity that's the problem. It's the sacrifice required. It's the cost. It's the cost. Changes the way we see everything. Changes the way we do everything. Literally changed the whole trajectory of our lives. Changes everything. You see, it's not just our heads that need to get saved. It's not just our hearts that need to get saved. It's our habits that need to get saved. Our habits need to be reoriented around the Jesus race. 
I've always done this, I do this with my money because I've got these goals and I'm going to meet them. You're going to go, cool. It, but now I realise that I and everything I have is God's. How would God have me steward it to carry on the work that he began? Because what does he say to his disciples? You guys will do even this things and even greater things. This is a commissioning. This is a affirming. I've started it. I've showed you how to do it. And now I'm going to get my spirit. And he's going to come and fill you. And then you are going to go and do that stuff. And so we see that in the early church in Acts 2 and Acts 4. There's these really controversial things. And over time, we're out of time. Maybe if the communion could be distributed, that would be great. Because this is the perfect place to land it. We realize that everything is his. And we would say, how is it that everything we have could be realigned? I can't spend my money on the things I used to spend my money on. I can't spend my time the way I used to spend my time. I can't spend my energy the way I used to spend my energy. I can't spend my attention on what I used to spend my attention on. Because some of us claim to be disciples. This is me putting my hand up. Some of us claim to be disciples of Jesus, but we actually spend more time being formed by the narrative of the world than we do by the story of Jesus. It's called Netflix. It's called Prime Video. It's called whatever it is that you watch. Whatever it is that you listen to, whatever you read. That's forming you, it's shaping you. Because why there's more court than talk? And just because it's not giving you um, 10 ways to lead a pagan life, it doesn't mean that you're not getting those signals through other, other means. Right? And then we sit and go, I wonder why I don't want to do things God's way. It's like, because you've spent more time learning how to do it the world's way. you spent more time with people and authors and thinkers that are teaching you how to be successful in the race that's not the Jesus race. And then you're trying to... But we're declaring and singing that we're all about the Jesus race. That's why communion becomes so, so important. Why? Because we are the head knowledge people, right? We talked about this at the start, in the middle, and we're finishing with it at the end. And we think that what we're drinking and eating today is the check that Jesus signed to get us out of jail. Is that fair? Go on. By his blood sacrifice. I always have a moment of cringing. I love, man, I so enjoy with Carl. I so enjoyed you leading us this morning. Anyone you know love it that it's clear that Carl has been with Jesus? Yeah. He just gets excited about Jesus. And then I'm excited about Jesus. And then the days I forget, I look at Carl and remember I'm excited about Jesus. And then he goes, let's lift the roof. And I'm like, yeah, we need to lift the roof. Jesus is that good. But he says, oh, come on, we drink from your cup. Well, in the, in the scripture, drinking from his cup is partnering with him in his suffering. This is the cup. And I agree with the sentiment, we need to drink from his cup. It's just not what we thought that was. What we thought was, is we just want to know your blessing. God, we just want to know your provision. God, we just want to know your... God, can we, can we be ones that just encounter your presence all the time? But when the Bible, the Scripture talks about the cup, it's talking about an invitation to engage in his suffering. Because we're not meant to just bank the check that he wrote. We're meant to imitate the example that he left. It's not just the means of salvation, it's the method of salvation. Because remember, it's not a one-time prayer, it's a daily laying down of your life. Whoever wants to come and follow me needs to pick up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to find their life must first lose it for my sake. Is that right? Right, this is just making sure it's not the Mormon temple. Or <laughs> Today we remember not just the God who was prepared to give up everything to come and make sure that we could be with Jesus first and foremost. That the divide between us and the presence of God would be removed through His sacrificial love and atoning sacrifice. I'm 100% for that. It's just more than that. John 13, when he had his disciples, he said, guys, I'm going to go and give my life for you. And I do this as an example for you to follow. So we do this as a commitment, again, to reaffirm our commitment, not just of gratitude for the fact that he has brought our freedom, 
and a major way that we can have a relationship with God. But we remember that the way he did it is the prototype for us. That just as he showed us what real love is, and real love is sacrificial, he's called us to sacrificial lives of loving what he loves, and what he loves is people, and what he loves is his church. Come on, the brothers and sisters, this is the language of Scripture. The winds of the Jesus race are not the winds of the world. This is our ticket to the Jesus race. He's bought our entry price, and then he just simply says, "If possible, would you go and live a life worthy of the call? Would you go and do likewise? Would you imitate me as I imitate Christ?" That was Paul's encouragement. Amen. So let's take this together and pray. Father God, we just thank you that you have made a way first and foremost. For us to be in relationship with you. We, can't, we couldn't even dream about being with Jesus. Encountering the Spirit of Jesus. The Holy Spirit in our everyday lives. Walking with Him. Being trained by Him. Uh, you bringing the text of Scripture to life to us. As we make it our daily bread. But God we also thank you that you gave us an example. Of what it means to run the Jesus race. Because you ran it first. And you invited us to come and to do life to pick up our cross, to lose our life for your name's sake, to die to our old way of thinking, to die to our old finish line and pick up your vision, your talos, your destination of a life lived well. And so today we take this with grateful hearts, but also as an affirmation that we remember, and we don't just remember in our heads, but we're going to take time this week to think about how our lives need to be realigned to the race that can only be run when we fix our eyes on you. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you've invited us into your work, the work the Bible calls the kingdom of God. Help us to be faithful citizens. Help us to be ones who live lives worthy of the call. Help us to not just be a group of people that have a list of ideas about what you're like, but of people who live in relationship with you, are being formed by that relationship, which leads to actions that point back to you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's take... Thank you so much, Pastor Mike. Um, that's, that's, a, that's the opening of our vision series, and we are going to take the time to um, unpack this. Uh, it's obviously some really big levels of commitment required uh, to actually step into this invitation. Uh, and so don't expect it all here right now today, uh, but let's commit to all that God would call us to in the next few weeks as we um, unpack this. And, and just want to emphasise even the sequential effects of this. All of these three ideas, they, they are completely intertwined. It's really hard to kind of separate them. And so it's great hearing it one message, but because we haven't separated them, it can be quite overwhelming too. Um, so we are going to, to some degree, separate them to unpack them. But please uh, acknowledge as we do that, all of them are intertwined. But I do love the idea of this initial calling. Um, to come and be with because uh, it's very disheartening to be told how you should live without knowing the person who's asking you to do something, to be with him. And that's what Jesus knew. And so that's the invitation really for the beginning of this process is that we would spend time with him because everything comes from that time with him. 
And so we will be unpacking next week about that first idea of what is it to actually spend time with Jesus. You know, he's not been physically here in the flesh for a couple of thousand years. How do we get that time with him? So um, press into that. Read through the Gospels and see what the disciples did. Look at the life of Jesus, how he lived and spent time with his father, who wasn't physically you know, in flesh with him, living, coaching him, but he spent time with, right? And this is uh, the example we look to when we're spending time with Jesus. We can look to his life and his life, time with his father. And so uh, look forward to uh, just what this does in our lives with us as a church, with us in our community, and uh, over the next coming weeks. Hope you're buckled in, committed to this, and, uh, and please just learn what it is to spend time with Jesus, at least initially, and let's see what happens from here. Cool. Great. Um, our giving is done primarily online, I think, so uh, we'll flick up those images. If you're not engaged in that process, just encourage you to jot down that number or find some of the information just to get that number. Uh, we do also have EFPOS at the desk if you want to swipe your card. Um, again, just to, it's a great way to orientate your life. Again, not around this race, but around this race. Let's do this together. And um, we do much appreciate your contributions to how we function as a family in that way. Uh, also, in tandem with that, I um, just want to highlight our storehouse ministry. We haven't done this in quite some time. But we have uh, a room that we have uh, some storage areas, like a large pantry. There's a basket you may have seen as you come into the foyer area, which is weekly available for you to bring any um, supermarket, like um, primarily pre preservable uh, products and cans and things like that. We uh, stash in there. Yeah, not fish. Please don't drop any raw fish in there. It's not going to end well. <laughs> Mike loves fish though, eh, Mike? He complains every time I bring tin tuna in for lunch. Like, oh, oh. so, uh, tin tuna would be fine. Tin tuna would be great, actually. It lasts a long time. But Mike won't eat it. <laughs> we will sit with people who do. Anyways, uh, so, I so um, Kirsty Jeffress, man, we've got some legends in our church, eh? Kirsty, who's out running Fusion, she actually leads our storehouse ministry, which... Um, gathers that food throughout that basket and we get connected with people, um, usually connected with people at church who are just going through a tough stage or perhaps are in transition with work or housing um, and or through other connections from our church with people who know others in their workplace who are in challenging situations. Um, all of our parenting stuff at the moment through our Connect and Play and Space program is actually connecting us with some really vulnerable um, people as well, friends of friends. And so it's just awesome to be able to actually give to people from the well of our church um, some sustenance. And so really practical ways to do that, just bringing in something extra from the shopping each week. But also um, there's a meals ministry that runs out of that too for evening meals primarily um, with hot food that's able to be, sorry, food that's able to be able to be heated um, through frozen meals. Um, and there's also a live like group, which a call goes out and a few people will volunteer just during their weekly cooking, I'll do an extra plate or two and be able to drop that off to someone. So well, that's been tremendously helpful too. Um, but over the last couple of months, Kirsty has been putting call out and there's only really been one or two people. So you might be thinking, man, this is awesome and it's so good to know that people are doing that. But if everyone thinks that, it doesn't actually happen. Um, and we've been putting calls out, only one or two people have been actually volunteering. It's a really tremendously powerful, tangible way to show the love of God. So please... As Kirsty asked around, as we asked around, there is actually a lot of need out there. Please uh, just consider what you could do with an extra plate or two once a week or once a month to contribute to that. Um, the other way you can do it is also um, perhaps if you don't have the time or energy or you're travelling and things, you don't have the capability to do that, you can donate money. Um, and then when we do a bulk cook, which Kirsty's got planned in the next month or so to have like a Saturday morning, uh, we can use that those donations or those food vouchers to stock up for the food that will be used in preparation for making like 30 frozen meals that can be handed out as part of that ministry too. So that's another way. Um, but hit up Kirsty, hit up any of our leaders about ways of getting connected with that. Um, it'd be awesome to be continuing to support um, our community with that. Cool. Storehouse plug done. Uh, Revelation Intensive. We had a promo video for this. So this is awesome. We did a series, I don't know how many years ago now, I found it tremendously helpful. It was raised with some really interesting teaching, not necessarily Pentecostal. I know that's got a, a whole other set of interesting teaching from Revelation, but I was raised in a different church with different teaching around this. found it tremendously helpful just to hear 
how the relations was written, who it was written by, who it was written for, how it applies to us and in our time and even end of time stuff, considering how it was written. So I encourage you to engage with this. If you've got some questions about it, um, please see Pastor Dawn or um, sign up through this. Is the video all good to go? I was trying to give you a heads up there with talking. Is it going to go for us? Here we go. Oh, look at that guy. Angels blowing trumpets, monsters rising from the deep, lakes of fire and rivers of blood, dragons rising from the deep and waging war, a lion that looks like a lamb? Ah, yes, the book of Revelation. That's what we're going to be looking at in this seminar on the book of Revelation. Uh, we're going to unpack John's apocalypse, his message for the church, and see all the intricate ways that he seeks to communicate this beautiful picture of hope for the church then and today. At the Connect Center in Timaru, we're going to be unpacking this letter. It's going to cost you a hundred bucks, but it's going to be money well worth it. Uh, we'll start at 9.30 a.m. and go through till 4 o'clock, and uh, we'll have some interactive discussions and we'll look at this letter in some detail. I hope to see you there. Very good. Yeah, cool. So there goes the dates, August 11 to 12. And with the $100 cost, it's obviously a large time frame, a couple of days. Please hit us up if you've got any issues around finance and would like some support. We would love to be able to support you to get uh, in amongst that some awesome teaching and some great content and really needs at least those two full days, honestly, to really unpack all of what's in this and encourage you to do that. And it includes meals for those two days, so good time, well spent. Awesome, last notice is Monday night, tomorrow night is our Empower Night. Once a month we do this, gather together, pray together, we listen together, we worship together, we share words of encouragement, we pray for one another. It's called Empower for a reason because we believe every person should be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live the life God has called them to. So come along if you would like some empowerment tomorrow night. Come along if you'd like to give some encouragement and bring some faith to the others in the room. We gather at 7.30 here in this room um, tomorrow night for prayer and worship and empowerment together. Oh, there's one more. 1st of September, Connect's Got Talent. Oh yes, it's that time of year, people. Come on. We do have some talent, man. This is an annual treat in our calendar. Uh, so just giving you a heads up. Start your brain ticking, start your dance moves in the mirror, start your lines memorising for whatever you're going to do, get your outfits stitched up and ready to go, Andrew Murdoch, and we will have a great time. Um, we're going to be hosting that in Waimati, they've got a tremendous venue and they actually love to put it on for us. So uh, it'll be a night out, coming up 1st of September, put out your calendar, talk to your friends, family, small group, and uh, let's get some uh, great quality talent together. For show. Awesome. That's a fundraiser for youth, by the way. It's not just a good time. Well, that's also a very good time. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Enjoy your Sunday and there'll be cakes. Yep. <laughs> the rest of the notices before the 1st of September will get you very select for that. It'll be a good time. Great. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday together.